Okay, here we go. Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm here with Sue uh, Jones. Uh, thanks, Sue, for joining me for this dialogue. Sure, thanks for having me. And uh, Sue, you're founder and director of Yoga Hope, and you've been practicing yoga for 15 years and uh, leading voice uh, in the subject of mind-body practices for self-regulation and personal empowerment. And you have a website, yogahope.org. And the way that I got connected uh, with you is you've written an article called uh, Exercise, Your yoga, uh, Exercise Your Empathy. And uh, what I thought we could do is talk about that article uh, as well as uh, the role of empathy in yoga. That's a topic that really interests me. So um, is there anything else you'd like to uh, you know, share about uh, your background or before we kind of jump into it? Well, you know, I would just say that everything that everything that I do for work, everything that I have learned has come from, you know, a natural a curiosity that has arisen out of my own personal experience. So, um, you know, it's just something I didn't go I specifically go to school to study this, but I just was driven to study it to try to understand my own experience, like I talk about in the article. Mm -hmm. To ex uh, for your own experience, do you mean yoga or empathy? Yeah, trying to understand how yoga changed the way I saw myself, saw other people, and then was able to really experience the power of empathy, and I think also value to come to a, come to value empathy as a as a human condition. Mm -hmm. So, uh, should we go through your article? Would you like to just uh, go through some of the points? That, um, perhaps we can just start with that. Uh, you, uh, sure you, you, have. Kind of, you, you, I have it here too. I'm just uh, looking at it, and you actually start off by saying uh, you're not into um, the shuka dukkha mudra <laughs> mantra business and uh, the woo woo kind of stuff. That that's uh, kind of not where your starting point is. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I mean, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of kind of ceremony, I guess you could call it, uh, attached to yoga practices and or Sanskrit and chanting. And for me, I knew I knew that the whole practice worked on a on a really cellular level, and so mm, I didn't never really connected with any of that. Um, you know, which doesn't mean that I think it's a bad thing, but I, I just personally never connected with any of the ceremony of it. It was very, it felt very cellular to me. Mm -hmm. So you were coming at it from more of a scientific kind of a point of view, I think. Is, is how yeah. I, I mean, mm -hmm. I really resonate with that because I don't like that either. Um, you know, you're talking about crystals and all that, and I think there's a, a you know, uh, an aspect to it, but it can kind of get kind of over overblown or something and I, I also really like the scientific understanding and you're you know you've gone into mere neurons and so forth yeah yeah so that's you know that's sort of what I meant by that like it, it wasn't an, I wanted to go deeper than that that wasn't enough for me oh well, would you like to say more about your article then like what um, just share more kind of just maybe just run through it Give it a little bit yeah, of overview. Oh gosh, I don't have it in front of me right now, but um, you know, I I I, I had a, a very profound uh, trans. I'd say a personal transformation as a result of starting to practice yoga, and it because you know because it wasn't about all of the ceremony of it and the chanting and the Sanskrit and all of that. I, I knew that it was something that happened. Um, on on a level that was not on the surface, and so I really wanted to understand what happened. You know, what happened to me that I was. I think I mentioned in my article that I was, you know, suicidal and um, very depressed, and I kind of saw myself as not, um, you know, not not having any reason. To, to be around, not having any worth. Sorry, my cat. <laughs> my cat likes the spotlight. Good prompt. And um, I kind of, um, at that time, I really did, you know, when I think back to it, I really did 
in my somehow it made sense to me that killing myself was the right thing to do, especially for my children and my then husband. And that changed. Uh, you know, once I started practicing yoga, that really changed, and I really wanted to understand how did that happen? Like, how did that change? How did I start seeing myself differently? And then how did I start seeing the world around me differently? So that was sort of the starting point. Um, you know, that period of suicidal ideation was kind of like my, the start of my journey. And then, um, then I started this organization, and uh, through that process, I started doing the research and trying to find out, you know, th when you have to raise money for an organization, you have to prove why, you know, that what you're doing works. Y you can't just, you know, show up with a handful of crystals. <laughs> you have to actually... Mm -hmm. So then I started doing the research, and I started discovering that um, just the process of moving your body, so, so mindfulness is really paying attention. It's, it's described or... Uh, it could be defined as paying attention in the present moment on purpose without judgment. You know, so just a simple noticing, whether it's going outside for a walk and noticing, you know, the quality of the air, noticing the steps you're taking, noticing the birds in the trees, whatever. Um, that's mindfulness. You know, yoga is mindfulness. It's a m m moving meditation. You know, meditation is mindfulness, noticing your breath, noticing how you your body feels inside. So as I started digging around into the research of the effect that mindfulness has on the brain, which they can really measure now with new fMRI you know, technology, um, I started to notice a couple of brain centers, kind of networks in the brain that were being affected by mindfulness. And these um, brain centers, this network that kind of works together, is uh, really known as kind of the seat of consciousness and the place where empathy really is fostered. So this is where this is where the article came from, and um, you know something that happens in those networks. Are there's some very specialized neurons? Um, one group is called mirror neurons, and one group is called spindle neurons. And the mirror neurons are really they're they're a recent discovery, late '80s, early '90s discovery in Italy. And initially, they thought that the mirror neurons were just utilized to mimic movement, you know, to watch somebody do something and then to mimic the movement. But then they started discovering that mirror neurons really are the mechanism behind feeling what somebody else is feeling. You know, being able to cry with somebody, you know, feel sorrow with somebody, feel anger and frustration with somebody. So really what was happening when I was practicing yoga through this mindfulness, paying attention, moving, you know, not judging, is literally exercising these brain centers, which are really the, the kind of the operating center for, for empathy. So that's what the article was about. So what I was hearing here is that you'd, you'd had an experience where you were thinking of, of committing suicide and that somehow you got into yoga and that was something that kind of gave you, uh, I don't know, a practice or a reason for kind of going on or kind of contributed to that. Uh, is, that is that right? Yeah, well what happens is that when you are using the neurotransmitters necessary to initiate movement, um, those are the those are the same neurotransmitters that kind of get your neurons ready to make connections, right? So that's new learning, and and at the same time, these brain networks, the anterior cingulate cortex and the anterior insula cortex, they start to become they, they start to come back online because they kind of go offline when you're experiencing chronic stress, mm -hmm. which is why mm -hmm. people that are um, that are traumatized or have PTSD. They also oftentimes lack a certain amount of empathy. And so once these brain centers start to come online, all kinds of stuff happens, not just empathy, but these are sort of the command centers for social emotion and emotion regulation. So I was able to actually start to kind of step out of that acute situation and kind of observe what was going on, observe the thoughts I was having, observe the feelings I was having, 
and at the same time really strengthening these brain networks that um, work towards you know all of the neurotransmitters that are that are um, used in these spindle neurons are you know vasopressin which is like oxytocin and serotonin and dopamine these brain, brain centers have more dopamine receptors like a, a huge concentration of dopamine receptors so it's reinforcing the reward mechanism around just the practice of yoga in general so lots of things is going lots of stuff is going on at, at the same time but essentially just by breathing moving and starting to use the natural materials of my body that are strengthening the areas of my brain that can pull out of this acute trauma and start to see things with a sense of compassion and empathy is what really changed you know changed my way of thinking and changed my life but it was the yoga that was the kind of the, the way that was starting to train your your empathy or, or those uh, circuits is what you're saying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I mean, here's here yeah. So here's some here's a metaphor. It's like that if we're a mirror, uh, you know, with our mirror neurons, and it could be like cloudy, right? Kind of like messed up with stress. Like stress is creating like a a, a clouding up a, of of the mirror to be mirroring others. And so you're kind of like saying that by study by practicing yoga. It's kind of clearing up the mirror in a sense, in the sense that you're connecting to your own, you're connecting to your own feelings. Uh, you're becoming more, and and we need to be able to do that to be able to see our own feelings, uh, connect with our own feelings, to kind of read the feelings of other, to mirror the feelings of other. So kind of metaphorically, if I just kind of create this metaphor, that the yoga is uh, kind of helping to clear your mirror uh, and. Um, it's also kind of reducing stress, uh, and the stress is something that kind of creates a clouding of the mirror. Right. Um, it's right. it's uh, it's kind of exercising the you know kind of it's it's allowing you to see your own the reflection uh, your own inner reflection of others as well. I guess too would be another way of looking at it. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it, it, you're exactly right. It's kind of like you have to be able to clear I like the mirror analogy right because the yoga clears the mirror to yourself and that's the first thing that has to happen but you have to be able to recognize and embrace your own humanity and that in, that involves everything you know that's being able to look at everything that you feel with without a sense of judgment and have compassion for yourself and then that clears the mirror you know that clears the the whole reflective mechanism for being able to have empathy for others. But th that's mm. so absolutely uh, right. Yoga yeah. So it's kind of like somehow internally we need to clear our own internal mirror so that we can then also mirror others in a sense. So it's kind of like a two-step, two parts to it. And then the yoga is kind of helping to do that is how I'm understanding. Absolutely. Yeah. It, although I will say that there are some you know, you can practice yoga and it the process can be inhibited if you're kind of judging yourself in the practice or, you know what I mean, if you're... Yeah. Oh, I'm not doing it right, this is not the right way, or you have a teacher who says, no, you're not doing it right, you're bad, or kind of bringing in that kind of uh, judgment can and kind of cause stress and an inhibition of that clarity of, of the reflection. That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, that's that whole. Well, that's what I'm really interested in. And so you're really. So it sounds like you really connected this whole mirror neuron aspect in terms of really explaining the dynamics of how all this is working, and it seems to me also to be core to explaining scientifically how empathy uh, works. You know, between people. So, um, so when you're you're distressed, you're. Um, you're you're kind of hopeless. You're I mean you're thinking of committing suicide. You probably feel disconnected from people. You're mentioning PTSD. You know that kind of shuts that down. So you start doing yoga, and um, you're kind of connecting, I guess, to yourself internally, right? It's like you're stretching those muscles and kind of feeling, or stretching the ligaments and the whole body. And you start feeling your body, is how I would imagine I mean how, how are you seeing it working 
Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, empathy is really like to feel with, right? And you can't feel with somebody if you're afraid of your own feelings. And in, in a lot of the work that I do, we talk about feelings as being as as being really sensations in the body. I mean, every emotion has a correlated uh, has a ha correlates with a body sensation because it's it's one integrated system. You know, your your emotional system, your hormonal system, your immune system, your nervous system. It's it's all one thing. So any feeling that you have, you know, feeling anger, grief, sadness, remorse, anything is going to have a correlated body sensation. But people that are extreme have extreme anxiety, stress, PTSD, whatever, they're a, they're resistant to those body sensations, mm -hmm. right? They're mm -hmm. resistant to those feelings. And so yoga really provides, and this is why it's so good for trauma survivors, which is the group that I work with, it provides or it can provide a safe space and a safe vehicle through which to allow those feelings to be felt um, without trying to shut them down, shut them off. And then once you're once you become unafraid of your own feelings, right, then you then then you start to cultivate that empathy. Right? Then you can feel with somebody. You know, if you're unafraid of your own grief, you can then grieve with somebody else. Because you're 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 open to that. You are letting your humanity be. You know, mm. so yoga's. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think yoga is so powerful in doing that because it does work first with the body. I mean, that's the first line of you know port of entry, so to speak, as opposed to talk therapy, which is good to kind of talk and you know kind of consider this and that. But when you look at feelings really being correlated with body sensations. Sometimes all you have to say to somebody who has like a real, real uh, intense trauma history, you know, look, this is just a sensation in your body, and yeah. you can breathe and like be with it, and don't try to figure it out. Just allow it to happen, and then tears might come, and you know, and that's okay, you know. And that's what really exercises that ability to to be to be empathetic to yourself, and then to others with others. Well, you'd, uh, you'd mentioned uh, mindfulness. There's a whole mindfulness practice about becoming attuned to yourself, and often you think of mindfulness in terms of, of uh, meditation, right? Sitting still, not moving, just watching the internal flow of, of ideas and sensations that are coming up. Whereas um, yoga, I mean, it's, you can kind of combine that with yoga, too, in terms of, it seems to me, in terms of... of uh, you know, starting to stretch those different muscles and body, you know, and, and stretch your body and then also combine that, um, that mindfulness in, in, a, in, a, in an active way because you're actively moving your, your body as well as sensing kind of mindfully what's happening. That's exactly, and that, that pairing is a very, that's a powerful combination because the moving, right, the mindful moving of your body, in particular when you're using complex motor movements, what that's really doing is it's, the, it's preparing all the materials that your body uses to create learning and memory. It's, it's preparing it for success, right? And that's what stress, uh, stress kind of destroys that, right? So the dendrites on the neuron will kind of pull in as, a, as a, um, a result of chronic stress and the hippocampus gets damaged, you know, that's where we store memories, that gets damaged as a result of chronic stress. So when you're, simply because you're engaging in this movement, right, you're, you're using the neurotransmitter, it's acetylcholine, which is so important for learning and memory, it actually prepares the materials, the neurons and, and you know, the receptor sites and the synapses for successful connections so that you literally are learning a new way of thinking and a new way of being, right? So the combination of the movement, which kind of gets those materials ready for success, and then the paying attention, which kind of ignites those brain networks that are in charge of things like, you know, empathy and emotional regulation, right? It's a it's a really good it's a good combination. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that it's, it's the stretching, the the movement, which is um, is uh, it's like you're 
it's like well, I, we're think we think with our bodies really. I mean, there's this notion, right, that we think abstractly, which is has been pretty much proven wrong. It, it's like thinking is not an external, you know, uh, you know, outside your body experience that we think with our body. So when we have a thought, there's actually uh, uh, physical sensations associated with with those thoughts. So um, and and it sounds like you're saying that that with doing the stretching, the yoga, that you're kind of moving your body in a sense. Uh, I mean, there's two parts of it. One is you're creating more space and more calmness for thinking more deeply or... Um, so I'm trying to understand, you know, kind of really understand what you were saying, maybe could, if I'm kind of getting it or... Yeah, so it's, there's a couple things going on at once. So the one is, if you just look at it from like a biological point of view, just like a neurological point of view, when you're engaging in complex motor movements, so not just yoga, but say like tai chi or karate or even rock climbing, something where you have to move your body and you have to breathe and you have to actually consider where your body is going in space, okay. that actually produces, a neuro, it, it, it requires a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, right, that's the neurotransmitter needed to move muscles, to move the skeleton, and that neurotransmitter plays a huge role in learning and memory. So you're kind of, let's say, let's use a garden analogy, you're sort of tilling the soil, right, when you're starting to move your body in a way where you're breathing and you're kind of having to think and consider, you know, there's a lot of balance involved in yoga and stuff, so you're tilling the soil so you can grow like a really um, a, a really healthy garden and then then you're starting to like you said feel the sensations in your body right you're being reminded by your teacher if you have a good teacher you're being reminded to just feel it and notice it and not like try to figure it out or make it go away or do something about it right so that's the mindfulness thing and just by paying attention you're really exercising your anterior cingulate cortex which is the brain center right, that houses these mirror neurons and these spindle neurons, right, that's the brain center that you need to turn on to, quote, pay attention. To so anything, did you start that, you that, that's, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, um, chain of events, you're saying that just physical movement creates that, that physical movement is kind of preparing you to start learning? Yeah. I mean, that's the basis of that's the first kind of premise that you're making that or, and you're kind of explaining yeah. how that works it sends off a whole cascade of of events in your body so kind of the more you move the, the better you can learn in a, right. in a sense uh -huh. okay exactly so no, I, that's exactly mm -hmm. right there's a lot of research out about like uh, physical fitness programs that they're starting to do before school you know 30 minutes before school start and the the scores of the students at these schools, how they're like coming coming in higher than like even the Asian countries on their math and science, you know, because the materials in your brain and in your body are prepared for successful learning. But then to your point about you think with your body, right, this is exactly right. I mean, we have 10 trillion neurons in our body, you know, we have 100 billion of them in our brain and 100 million of them in our gut, and they're, they're the same cells, they're from the same membrane from the embryo. The, the, the membrane just folds in on itself and creates the spinal cord with all of the organs and you know the gut on one end and the brain on the other end. So you really do think with your body, but we as a society, as a culture, especially Americans, we get very disconnected from the wisdom of our body, right? So you're really cultivating, I mean, you're not only cultivating empathy when you're practicing, you're also cu cultivating intuition, right? Your ability to recognize your intuition, which is really your gut instinct, and your compassion, which is really around the heart. Because all of the viscera around the heart, the neural networks around the heart, they connect directly with the brain centers that recognize connection. So when you lose connection with somebody, you really do feel heartbroken. You really mm -hmm. do feel it in your heart, you know? So you're starting to really uh, acknowledge when you practice this and you're given, so whether it's yoga or meditation, whatever it is, when you're feeling into your body and really noticing how the, your body feels inside from the inside out, you're starting to acknowledge that your body has something to say, you know, and that it has wisdom. And this is something that, you know, 
it just creates this open channel through which compassion and empathy can happen. Right? It's like you can't be empathetic if everything is closed off, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so stress. Just, and then, mm -hmm. Yeah, so stress and right. fear uh, are kind of inhibit our bodily sensations that kind of inhibit the uh, you know the connection our own connection uh, smooth connection between our body and brain and our thinking and that um, and empathy because we need we need that smooth connection uh, between within ourselves that integration to be able to read the emotions of others because we're inhibiting our own feelings that means we're inhibiting reading and empathizing with the feelings of others so um, is that's how I'm understanding the yeah that's exactly uh, right you know and and you know as far as empathy empathy goes when we practice it right as human beings I mean it's we we always it goes against what we think we should be doing, right? Because empathy requires not fixing something, you know, not changing something, just being able to hear somebody and say, like, yeah, you know, that sucks, right? So, like, if my kid is sad about something, being able to say, honey, that sounds really tough. You know, that really, that sucks, right? And not, not try to, like, fix it or make it better, but it's the stress, my stress, that's going to make me feel like I gotta make this better for my kid you know I have to make him feel better I have to fix the problem right that's my job as a mom so empathy is it is a practice because it's not it doesn't come easy to us you know mostly because of what we think we should be doing which is really driven from stress or driven from you know some sort of fear of not being good enough or all of that stuff Mm -hmm. So when you're yeah. saying that, that, that empathy is a practice, are you meaning the practice in terms of yoga is a practice you're connecting with your body? So that's part of the practice of empathy. Are you meaning it right. in that way that you need to kind of tune yeah. your body as the mirror? You know, you got to exercise that mirror and get that mirror working clearly, and that's part of the exercise. That's part of the steps in terms of connecting with others. Right, and when you, you know, if you were just to look at a real concrete example, when you're able to practice yoga and notice that you feel a certain way and just be with yourself in that feeling, in that way, in whatever way you are, you know, without saying, oh, I'm so tired, i got to, you know, I've got to get it together, or just be able to be with yourself in whatever way you are in that moment you're practicing empathy, right? You're, you're practicing on your mat so that you can actually do it off your mat, you know, just to be able to be with somebody else. Mm -hmm. in, you know, feel with that somebody else. And that's a big part of this program that I designed. There's a real opportunity for empathy in the program, right? Just it's how we train our facilit facilitators is when somebody is having an emotion give them space to have it be with them in that emotion don't try to give them a solution or fix their problem right it's let them have the feeling mm -hmm. and how do you do that you know? kind of in a anecdotally what are you doing is there's someone there that's having a, a problem I mean, you're, you're saying is as, as a teacher right they're they're doing a an exercise maybe it's connecting to a painful past memory or they're becoming sad or or something's coming up and they're feeling distressed or some of that feelings coming up what 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 kind of happens how does that work well if it's in the program that I designed it's usually going to be happening um, in the discussion part of it and if somebody has something coming up you know they have like a big emotion come up the facilitator will you know give them some space and then sort of say to the group can can everybody feel what she's feeling? Most of the women, it's all women, most of the women say yes. And then the facilitator will instruct the group to put their hands on their body where they feel sensation and then take some and we'll take some breaths together. And that really is like a real concrete way of saying your emotions are in your body and you can be with your emotions and reduce, like diminish the distress of these emotions so that you can just let them be. So that's how the pro you know this program that I designed kind of works. Mm -hmm. So do you have other kind of insights about empathy um, that 
that yeah. come up around yeah, that? Yeah, there's a little really, there's a really um, cool, one of the coolest things that I've discovered is that um, there's an area of the brain called the um, um, anterior insula cortex, and this area of the brain, it's really deep in the brain, it's tough to get pictures of it, but this is an area of the brain that ha they, it's, it's um, experienced increased gray matter as a result of mindfulness meditation. And one of the things that this brain area does is it registers body sensations, right, internal body sensations, and it recasts them as social emotions. So what that means is that if you're experiencing like pain or constriction, this is the area of the brain that's going to recast those feelings as maybe those sensations as maybe fear or worry or doubt, you know, or denial. But if you're experiencing body sensations that are sort of soothing and pleasing, which is what happens when you practice yoga because you're really turning on the Sympathetic, the parasympathetic nervous system and all the kind of neuropeptides, the, the neurotransmitters that are kind of the feel-good mood regulating ones, then your social emotions are going to kind of be recast through this brain center as things like gratitude, acceptance, you know, love, empathy, compassion. So I personally think that that's really cool because, you know, who knew? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, like, who knew that your brain even did that for you? But it makes sense, you know? So it makes sense how, like, if you're stressed, that can create this, like, kind of a, a feedback loop that goes, you know, in a bad direction. Or it, if you're practicing, it also creates a feedback loop that can go in a more expansive direction, right? And that's going to that's going to involve feeling, being able to be empathetic, right? Instead of saying, so for me, like, a good example would be, instead of seeing somebody who's homeless on the street and feeling like, oh, they're going to come ask me for something and get all defensive, to sort of open up to that and say, I'm going to put some change in their cup, right? I'm going to make this choice. Or like, mm -hmm. just, you know, and practicing, like, just holding the door open for people, letting someone c go in front of you when you're driving, you know, that's practicing, you know, all of those things that yoga opens you up to. I didn't quite understand that, that in, in terms of, of uh, you're saying it, I mean, what's coming to me is an experience of, like I do like a freestyle dance, and um, so that's where I do have a lot of the physical motion that you're talking about, and you know, I can really feel it after I've done dancing, my body's in a whole different state, my whole awareness is in a different state, if I kind of came in kind of stressed or, or you know, tired, I feel kind of energetic and, you know, have a lot of a sense of space, but I've noticed that, um, that uh, in the dance, once I've done kind of like an ex, I've thought, well, I'm feeling a lot of stress inside myself, anxiety. And I said, well, I want to go to the anxiety. I want to, I want to really get as close as I can and really feel it and let it kind of fill my awareness and really look at the, the essence of it, the, the, the fine, you know, uh, qualities of it and really look at it and really, you know, be present with it. And what I noticed is as I was dancing and I was just kind of feeling my way uh, into this uh, anxiety or fear, that as I got really close to it, it kind of dissolved and disappeared. And it was right. like, and it didn't take long. It was like, uh, you know, four or five seconds. And, it, and that fear was kind of like a, a, a fear I could feel in my body kind of through this. And then another one came, a kind of an anxiety that was like a cloud over me, you know, it was like, I said, okay, there's another one, you know, let's go check that one out, and I got close, and I could feel, you know, and I could feel the qualities of it, it was like a, cl uh, a white, heavy, you know, oppressive cloud that was kind of clouding my, my, uh, my, my mind and my body, and then I got really close to it, and it's almost as if it just kind of dissipated and changed. And then there was, uh, you know, kind of a, a nice feeling. And then um, it was, 
like another four or five seconds, there was another one. And it had a whole different shape, a whole different contour, and a whole different quality. And I went and, you know, went to that one. It, and so I kept doing that for quite a while. There was someone, for example, that I would, in a dance, I would uh, dance with her, and then she would always turn and dance, and, you know, move away, you know, after a, you know, a few seconds or something. So, and, and then it kind of made me anxious, you know, for a sense of rejection or something. So I started dancing with her. I said, oh, there's that feeling of rejection, you know, the heart kind of, kind of, uh, kind of constricts and, and, you know, in the body, I said, okay, I'm going to go to that, you know, take a deep breath. I'm, I'm going, getting as close as I can to that. And then it was almost as if that kind of dissipated. And, you know, we ended up, and it, and it was like a whole series of these kind of fears kind of came up through the dance, but I just kept going to them. And it was somehow my presence, we ended up having this fantastic, you know, 15 minute dance, uh, and so anyway, this kind of kept going, you know, for, you know, for an hour and a half or something. And at the end, I was just like totally in bliss. It was pretty amazing. So it's kind of, I'm trying to kind of map that onto what you're saying in the sense of, of, uh, of uh, what, that's where I'm seeing the transformation that happened is by going to the experience of the anxiety or the fear of being present, trying to get close to it, not avoiding it, not going, doing something else, not, you know, putting it under the rug, not fighting it, you know. I just went to be present with it and it dissolved. So, and what I'm hearing is what you're saying is that there's the, the, the physiological mechanisms for that transformation to uh, kind of happen, like how that's happening in the brain. So, does that kind of, you know, kind of, map on to what you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. If you just kind of look at it in terms of what is, um, you know, what is this anxiety, what is this stress, right? It's just an, a misunderstanding in your, in your brain, in sort of the reptilian limbic brain, that there's a danger present to you, right? That's the, that's the stress response is designed to keep you safe, right? To keep you away from the lion that's chasing you. So by running away from that or judging it, right, you're just creating more stress. Yeah. Right? You're just yeah. perpetuating that anxiety. But by sort of saying, I'm going to actually go towards this and check it out and see kind of is it really a is this really a danger to me? And what you were discovering in the story that you're telling me or that I heard was what you were discovering was no, it's not a danger. And so because you were dancing and moving and all of your material, right, your learning material, your neurons, your synapses, your neurotransmitters were like in good shape to remember that, right? Each time you did that, you created another piece of learning, yeah. which is essentially another memory. And so what you do is you create context for future situations. That's how transformation happens. So the next time whatever the, you know, the situation, the, all of the components line up where you might possibly have this moment of anxiety, right, around rejection or whatever it is, you're going to have some context for that. And so you might experience like this much anxi anxiety instead of this much anxiety because you've done this, right, learning. But the learning, it can only happen if you do, right, say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, well, to walk towards this. I'm going to check this out. Right, but where where people get into real trouble, and this is really the group that I work with, you know, female inmates and women in substance abuse recovery, they've been avoiding those feelings so strongly that at some point in their lives, like the only thing that would get them away from it, you know, is to shoot heroin or to you know drink vodka or whatever. Yeah, it's you know, painful. And, and it really alienates us from ourselves and others, which is a very painful experience. Right. So it's like, you know, um, I mean, empathy is one of those, something that I think is so um, valuable to us as human beings and gives us such an opportunity to help sort of heal one another because when somebody can come to you and say somebody can come to me whether it's a woman in prison or a, 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 a woman who's you know recovering from heroin addiction or whatever and say hey you know like this is this is how I felt or this is how I feel right 
just by being able to have that experience like you were just talking about moving towards these difficult emotions it gives you the ability to say you know what me too mm -hmm. right get that you know like you you're not ashamed to admit that you felt that way you're not scared to talk about that feeling right you've kind of made your peace with it or you you've uh, you can appreciate it Mm -hmm. yeah, you're, you're not keeping it in, you're letting it out and letting it kind of flow into into the world. Right. And then you can you can you can feel empathy for somebody and when you feel empathy for somebody that gives them that helps them learn how to feel empathy for somebody else. Right? And then and then it just creates a virtuous cycle. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. And I think it does. But it, uh, another aspect that's coming up here is kind of the definitions of empathy. You know, I've, I've been you know talking to an awful lot of people about empathy and some of the academics, and they actually you know they disagree with each other. They they're pointing to different aspects of empathy. So I've been trying to you know kind of create the more holistic definition of empathy. So I thought I might could just share you share with you what my definition is and see how that kind of resonates. Yeah. So I'm seeing okay. empathy is like four parts to it, and the first part is uh, self-empathy. So that's what, really what we've been talking a lot about, is about that connection within ourselves. So becoming attuned to those felt uh, bodily sensations with our, within ourselves, and being able to be present with them and, and uh, connect with that sensory awareness. The second part is uh, mirrored empathy, and you know the academics kind of call it the uh, emotional contagion or emotional empathy, and that's um, kind of the mirror neurons that you know when we see an action and do an action, the same neurons fire within ourselves. So as I'm waving my hand, you know supposedly there's these neurons firing in your brains as if you were doing the same thing. So that's kind of that. Uh, mirroring of of each other, and uh, you know, the clearer our own self empathy is, the more we can kind of attune to the, those sensations. So then there's um, that's the mirrored empathy. Then there's the imaginative empathy. Is that as we have a sense of uh, self awareness that we're separate beings, we can actually kind of step out and take the perspective of someone else to see what the world would look like from their perspective and it connects with the you know the experience too so you know uh, actors are you know really good at that um, the academics uh, call that perspective taking or uh, cognitive empathy which I think is a little not quite accurate but so then um, so that's the the uh, imaginative empathy and then there's empathic um, arising empathic creativity or empathic action which is as we connect with each other and we kind of uh, kind of attuned to each other that we're kind of like biologically wired to want to contribute to the well-being of each other and so as we connect uh, it's like our our brain automatically looks how to contribute to the well-being in these new feelings, these new ideas kind of just arise out of that connection and we kind of take action um, out of that and I've seen it in in mediation, you know, two people are totally you know, pissed off at each other, you empathize with them, you turn them to each other and they start talking to each other and start creating empathy and then some kind of a, a synchronization, a connection happens between them and then it's like, well, what do we do now? And they'll say, you know, if they've been neighbors who have been arguing, they say, oh, well, this is how we'll solve the problem. You know, we'll cut down the tree that's hanging over your backyard, or we'll get together weekly for a beer to talk about, you know, neighborhood issues. And uh, so that's kind of the, the framework that I've been using. Um, and uh, I call it the wheel. I mean, the, the wheel and feel of empathy. That's kind of like the model. That's one way of looking at it. It's kind of like a you know a model, and you can just keep adding components to that to that wheel. And then there's also the feel of empathy. What is the what does it feel like when you're empathizing and connecting with someone? You know, it might be warm. It might be um, you know open. Um, you know, connecting or a whole variety of felt sensations. So that's kind of how I'm approaching it. Just wondering how that resonates with your understanding. Yeah. 
That yeah, that completely resonates with me. And I also feel like as I was I was listening to you go through like the four components, to me it seemed and I was sort of reflecting back on my own experience, it seemed very cumulative. You know, like that self empathy was the very first thing that happened. It, the first thing that happened to me was sort of I ha I remember having these moments where I was like, wait a minute, like I'm actually a good person and this is not how I want to think about myself and this is not the kind of life I want to be living you know and having that self empathy was really like the foundation and then you know the second one what was the second one that it's you said mirrored was like, empathy you know, um, kind of that yeah. mirroring that happens yeah so it seems like that's it seems like a cumulative for me anyway in my personal experience it was like a cumulative thing and that sort of as I started really getting more compassionate towards myself and more, you know, more healthy, less stressed, more grounded, then I was able to start feeling altruistic, you know, and really like, wow, I have to help other women find this, this thing that I found, this ability to think differently about myself, to know, to understand that I have something worth giving, something worth being around for, that I'm wise, that I'm, you know, and the first thing we say when we go into work with a group of women, you know, I remember saying to the inmates, we're not here to teach you anything you don't know, we're here to help you discover what it is you already know, you know, that you just may not know you know, or, you know. Yeah, so, so, you're, oh, so you're saying um, that uh, you would had a lot of self-judgments, and that self-judgment was uh, blocking that self-empathy, then that self-connection to yourself. If you're judging and saying, no, what I'm feeling is bad, that's a way of kind of shutting down your awareness and experience of those feelings. Oh, yeah. And then yeah. you're saying, oh, I've been doing this. This is like really, this doesn't work. And then if I just kind of connect to it, that this is, you're just seeing that you're um, that that really works for you and you're going to share those insights with others and contribute to their well-being because you know how much they're suffering, you know, through their own self-judgments. Right, exactly. Exactly. And then, you know, just just looking at it from a scientific point of view, like the, from the research that I've been doing, you do need to, it's going, you're going to be more successful in, in finding that shift in thinking and feeling through some sort of practice, and dance is a good example, right, because it's not yoga, but it is moving your body, and it is utilizing um, materials in your organism that create uh, less stress, right, so you're reducing your stress, and give you the ability to make new neural connections, right, so you can get stuck in that, you can get really stuck in that place of self-judgment and self-criticism and if you're not engaging in a practice and some practice that can reduce your stress and um, and enhance your chances of thinking differently creating if you think of learning as sim like very simply being new neural connections right you'll you'll remain stuck so those practices you know could be could be karate you know could be you know, could be any anything that involves you know breath and movement. That's going to get the materials ready for your brain, and then the mindfulness is going to really help enhance that mm. compassion. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think then about you're saying that that the exercise and the bodily movement is is kind of like uh, you know it's like limbering up the. Uh, the uh, your tool, your empathic tool. The body is the empathic tool, and, and moving it is uh, you know first it it's it's uh, releasing just um, you know whatever the hormones are, endorphins, right? And that's kind of relaxing you, and that then that's then you kind of have a little bit more capacity for doing the other parts of the getting rid of the judgments or whatever or the mindfulness. Um, so. Right. So okay, so it's it's um, it's exercise, some kind of exercise to to have that, and then um, to have a practice where you're doing it on a regular basis, is the other part. Then, 
Right. If you want to think, of, go back to the garden example. You get the soil ready, right? That's the that's the kind of the movement, the breathing. That's preparing the soil. Okay. Then you got to decide what do you want to grow. You know, what do you want to grow? Do you want to practice compassion? Do you want to practice, you know, you want to practice mathematics? <laughs> you know, like what what is it that do you want to grow in that garden? And then if you're practicing, um, if you're engaging in a mindfulness practice, what you're really growing is your compassion and your empathy, gratitude, love, acceptance. That's what you're growing in your garden. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's kind of like the self-empathy uh, kind of phase of it. Uh, and we're doing something called uh, Empathy Circle, so we meet, um, you know, we have groups that meet online and like four to five people in a circle and it's about how do we foster empathy and actually build a culture of empathy. So how do we do social um, change uh, to, you know, make get empathy be part of uh, the social value that our culture has. And so one thing we do is we start off with kind of mindfulness, like uh, connecting, you know, a few moments and then tuning into whatever feeling is kind of the most energetic for you at the moment and then we we translate that into a felt experience I mean not a felt experience into a into a emotion that we can share with the group then we, we kind of practice that with our eyes closed and we come back to the circle and then we actually go around and everyone shares their emotion that they have and everybody mirrors the motion. So that's kind of going from the self-empathy to the mirrored empathy where we're seeing the person's emotion kind of manifest and then we're kind of feeling it but then we're actually taking the next step of kind of reflecting it back to them and that there's that quality of the synchronization that happens which I think I can't remember the, the science of it but I think in that synchronicity there's something about synchronicity with others that actually releases um, oxytocin. That there's this sense that yeah. oh, I'm in, I'm yeah, in connection. connection. I'm in, I'm in connection with someone. We're synchronizing. We, we're in harmony. We're not in dissidence. And that's a, um, that's a, I'm safe. You know, there's something. I'm being seen by others, so I'm safe. You know, then a little bit of oxytocin comes up, and we kind of feel even calmer and more relaxed. And then we get kind of can sink more deeply into that sense of connection. And um, so that would be the next phase is we're, you know, we've been talking about the self connection. Then it's, there's the next step would be is how do we increase that resonance and that synchronization and that empathy with others? Yeah. Well, I love that idea and it's kind of what we're doing with the program that I designed. It's kind of, sorry, <laughs> it's kind of what's happening in the program that we're running for trauma survivors is creating, strengthening this empathy, but also at the same time it's strengthening things like awareness and faith. And the, the result of that, the results have been very powerful. I mean, when we did this in Haiti, we never even spoke to the groups about how they parent their children. Um, you know, it's not a parenting program. But by the time we were done training this group, they all really expressed a desire to stop beating their children. And you know, beating your children in Haiti is something that's socially encouraged. Mm -hmm. Like you're really you're really told that that's what your job as a parent is is to you know to beat your children and like daily, you know. So they had this like real profound realization, you know, through our groups and. Um, I think it really is a matter of creating this virtuous cycle. Like you do start with these groups and just this, like you said, like connection and not being told, don't, you know, you shouldn't feel this or this needs to change or I don't understand you. Just being told like, yes, I'm here with you. You know, I get it. Right? Creates this connection, which actually nice. something that's really interesting about oxytocin is that it also, um, P people who have higher levels of oxytocin are more willing to trust and take risks, right? And that and human relationship is really all about risk taking because you have to risk rejection. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's a risk to open yourself up to somebody. So people, so they've done a lot of studies on um, 
on oxytocin and also like people who have lower cortisol levels, they're more willing to take a risk, you know? So that's, I think that's how the virtuous cycle is created is through this one circle when people start to enhance their, you know, sort of feel good hormones and their social emotions, then they're, then they're going to be more willing to go out and take a risk and connect with other people. I think that's how it will happen. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a, you start a, a kind of a virtuous empathic spiral in a sense. If right. we have a, you know, a stress spiral where you get more and more stressed, you know, you get more, you get disconnected, which means yeah. you get more fearful, you get right. more disconnected, and then you kind of pull into yourself. If we kind of start with the self-empathy, start fostering that, start with our connections, we we're becoming able to take risks to kind of connect even more and to reach out more. And if we get, you know, kind of a positive connection from that, you know, we get more trust, then it can create this whole spiral of, of more connection and, and empathy is kind of how I'm yeah. reading that. Yeah. yeah. So, That's what I think. Mm -hmm. So are you, have you been looking like you really looked at the science for the self connection part? Have you been looking at that, like the synchronization and the, you know, the, and that part much, you know, because I've been, I was talking about the mirrored empathy, right? Because it's the, um, because we're, in the empathy circles, we, we, uh, we have that physical, um, that physical, uh, you know, manifestation of our, of our feeling and then in the mirroring, so we're seen. So it's, it's that, that's the, I guess that's what I'm getting at, is the importance of being seen and being reflected, to, to see that yeah. we're not alone, and that, oh, you see me, you see how I feel, and I really have an acknowledgement that I can really see that you get who I am and feel who I am. And so then we go into a um, kind of doing reflective listening, you know, the Carl Rogers uh, type approach which is like foundational in, in therapy and and just I think in human relationships itself is that we we do uh, we kind of connect with okay what were what were we experiencing and then we start dialoguing about it and we do it in a reflective listening approach so that you know you're sharing something and then I hear it and reflect back the meaning to you until you feel fully reflected and and and, uh, and uh, seen, and then it's your turn to speak, and then we continue. So, um, I guess what I'm talking about, getting at, is the the relational part of the empathy. Um, you know, kind of your thoughts about that, kind of going a little deeper. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's one of the reasons why the program I designed is not just yoga. There is a a discussion part of the program where it is all relational and it's about mutuality, right? So it's not about having a leader. I mean, there is a facilitator, but it's about if somebody says, you know, this is what I, usually we start the conversation with um, having the women read, you know, a quote that's in the book and then we'll sort of discuss it. And the, the facilitator's job is really to make these connections. Somebody will say, well, to me, this is really saying, you know, X, Y, Z. And it's the facilitator's job to say, um, does anybody feel similar to, you know, Patty? Does any, you know, do, can, you, can you resonate with what she's saying? And then somebody will say, yeah, well, I feel, you know, like really, I feel very similar to, to her and also blah de blah and then you know the facilitator will say you know who can tell me what you know Joan just said you know what I mean so it's like mm -hmm. it's it's the facilitator's job is to facilitate these connections and to really show the group hey look like we're we, we have this like equality and these mutual this mutuality we all there's no feelings that are bad or wrong and we're all learning from one another and then the benefit of the, the yoga that comes with the program is that anything that is kind of stirred up that doesn't feel resolved is always going to feel resolved after the yoga practice and the meditation because that really takes, if you're just looking at it from a physiological point of view, that takes all of the, any residual stress that's come up as, as, a, as a result of that conversation and it's completely dissipated because you're fully in your, you know, parasympathetic nervous system and you've kind of replaced 
all of those stress hormones and neurotransmitters with more mood regulating ones and oxytocin and you know um, serotonin and all of those so it kind of because of the real integrated holistic nature of the program it sort of does does all of it mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're kind of facilitating, you have a facilitator who's kind of facilitating the dialogue and people are kind of sharing their experiences and, and kind of going back and forth uh, sharing their, their experiences and creating that uh, connection and that deeper insight. Then. Yeah, and oftentimes, you know, some of the most powerful times are when, let's say somebody's having a, somebody might be having a, mentioning a problem they're having with say a family member and neighbor blah, blah 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 and they're starting to get kind of worked up and then right this is right so this here's where you see mirror neurons at work somebody else will start to get worked up with them and but try to give them advice solve their problem right well maybe you can find another place to live well maybe you can just this well maybe you can just that and then the facilitator says let's just stop the conversation for a second I just want everybody to just kind of take a moment feel into your body where you might be feeling some sensation because everybody in that group is going to start to feel that anxiety, you know? Put your hand on your body where you feel some sensation and we're going to take three breaths together. And that's a, that is a way for the facilitator to say, there is a way to come back to neutral when you feel yourself getting imbalanced. You know, when you mm -hmm. feel yourself fighting or wanting to change. So you have two things going on. You have one person who's sort of wanting their life situation to be different. You have another person who's wanting to fix their problem for them. They're both kind of fear driven and the anxiety is amping up, right? The facilitator gets to say, let's just stop, feel into your body, put your hand on your body where you feel some sensation and let's breathe. So it's very powerful, you know? Yeah, you're, uh, I mean, there's so many blocks to empathy, uh, judgment, trying to fix someone, kind of, you know, yeah. take the attention away from them. And so what you, it sounds like what you're saying is that the facilitator, you know, says, uh, tries to bring people back, I mean, the participants back to just what's the felt sensation. Don't try to fix them. Don't judge them. Just be aware. Be present with that feeling, you know, feel uh, kind of what I was doing with the fear, that story. You know, go be present with it. Just look at it. Don't try to, don't try to do anything. Just bring your presence to it. And it kind of like it. It's almost like to bring the presence to it itself almost and uh, un, unravels it in, in a sense. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's I was in a class the other day and the yoga teacher said that which you resist persists. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that's really what it is. When you resist it, you create more stress. When you allow it, when you just allow it and you be with it it's right it kind of dissipates yeah it's almost as if the body kind of takes care of it it's like you don't even have to consciously necessarily consciously work on it you just have to be with it and it's like the right. body there's something like body wisdom or something it's like it, it's trying to solve automatically trying to solve it pro internal problems uh, and if you can just kind of be aware of it and be present with it it'll help to, it'll, it kind of resolves itself if it doesn't kill you or something, I guess, you know, in that sense. Going back to the yeah. fear, right? I just went to it and I didn't do anything except bring my presence to it and it kind of dissolved. And then I just had to go on to the next thing, kind of continue to be present with the next thing that came up. Yeah, and that, to me, that's really what empathy is, whether it's around the self or around someone else. It's just being with, mm -hmm. you know, feeling, not trying to do anything about it, just presence, you know, that's it, just presence. Mm -hmm. Well, great. I mean, this is a fantastic discussion. I love where you're coming from, from the body, you know, from the uh, embodied uh, experience and kind of tying that with, um, and with yoga and uh, the science. I mean, it's a great, uh, you know, combination. It's kind of how I kind of look at this too, from the from the experience, from the arts, from and then with the science. So, uh, really enjoy the conversation and 
uh, hope we can, you know, kind of continue. There's, uh, it, uh, I'd like to do some panels, you know, at some point, you know, around uh, yoga and and uh, and empathy. And I mean, it's been very enlightening to see, you know, the connection with uh, yoga and empathy. Yeah, I agree. It's been enlightening for me too. <laughs> okay, great. Well, let me. Uh, um, unless there's something, if you, if you have any burning issue, every burning topic, I didn't want to keep you too much over our, our hour. I don't yeah. know how your schedule is. I feel like but, we covered it. Okay, great. I feel like we covered it. Uh -huh. Okay, great. well then, great. Then uh, I'll hit the end then button.